shortage. How synthetic biology transforms the biosciences. Christina Smolke, Stanford University. When the Berlin Wall came down, I was 14 and I was amazed at this big event on the other side of the world. We're gonna to talk today about the power of biology to make things. And we're gonna start with the simple and familiar. <laughs> so, beer, wine, these are products of a simple microorganism called yeast that are made through a process called fermentation. And through the process of fermentation, yeast takes sugar and converts it to molecules like ethanol, carbon dioxide, and other simple organic compounds. Now these molecules are adding value to the final product by influencing the taste, the aroma, and the texture. And humans have used the process of fermentation for many thousands of years. Now let's zoom out and let's think beyond single-celled microorganisms. What is happening in the natural world? Well, nature is constantly making molecules. Why? Because it's essential for its survival, the survival of organisms. And let's think about plants as an example, okay? Plants can't move. They can't run away from threats. And so, as a result, they've evolved over many thousands of years to make molecules, and they use these molecules to interact with their environment and to influence their environment. Now, in contrast to the simple molecules that you get as a result of yeast fermentation, the molecules that plants are making are much more complex. Nature is essentially designing these molecules to interact with the cells and with the processes of animals, including humans. And ultimately, they're influencing our physiology. Now, over time, humans have uncovered that these molecules have tremendous value, and they have met value in treating and curing diseases and ailments. And so, now today, over half of our medicines come from nature. These active molecules are extracted and isolated from the natural world, and then ultimately dosed into a final form that's used as a medicine. But there are many more molecules that remain uncovered and that are used in traditional medicines in the form of the entire host organism. Now, uncovering medicines from nature has inherent limitations. The first is that these molecules are made in vanishingly small amounts, oftentimes, in rare medicinal plants that grow quite slowly and in particular environments. And so sourcing enough of these molecules from those rare plants can be very challenging and in, in many cases very difficult to do in an environmentally friendly way. Oftentimes we wind up over harvesting these plants and then losing irreplaceable diversity from the natural world. And the second challenge is that these molecules oftentimes have to be improved. Nature is not making them as medicines for humans, they're making them for their own purposes, and the processes that we use to improve and upgrade these molecules are very inefficient, costly, and in many cases, impossible. And so, as a result, these various challenges can lead to decades of research and development that are required to take a molecule and bring it to market as a medicine. And these challenges 
essentially create hurdles or walls in developing new and better medicines. Now, in the case where we have been able to take molecules that we've identified from nature and bring them successfully to market, what do those supply chains look like? Well, this is a picture of an opium poppy farm. An opium poppy actually winds up sourcing many valuable and diverse medicines. Most of us are probably familiar with the medicines that are used to treat pain and cough, but there are a number of other medicines as well. There are medicines that are used to treat addiction and overdose and opioid-induced side effects. There are newer, innovator medicines that are coming on the market that are being used to treat chronic pain and have less addictive properties. There are also antispasmodic medicines and medicines that are used to treat cancer. All of these different medicines come from this single medicinal plant. Now, let's think about the challenges that come up when you source medicines at this scale by harvesting from plants. The first is that it's a process that has inherent risks and uncertainty associated with it. So the plants in this case will grow over an annual growing season, and over that time, you can have different environmental changes that occur in a particular region that can affect the yield and the quality of the medicine. You also have different geopolitical and socioeconomic factors that can affect supply and add uncertainty as well. The second is that the process winds up being very costly to our environment and our planet. Growing these plants requires a lot of arable land, it's depleting to the land, and also requires a lot of chemicals in order to boost yields and then to extract the molecules from the physical plant material. And the third challenge that we face is really one of access. Most people on this planet do not have access to important medicines. In the case of opioids, these are classified as essential medicines in palliative care, and the World Health Organization has estimated that over 5.5 billion people on the planet do not have sufficient access to these medicines to treat moderate and severe pain. Now, with this particular example, we also have the case where there's abuse of these compounds, and in particular, in countries like the US, where I'm from, we're facing an epidemic. This is also a result of a system that has prioritized profits over the health of people. Now, when we look at a picture like this, what we'd like to see is all regions of our planet being shaded as dark green. But clearly, that's not the case. And so there are a number of reasons for this, but within the top reasons in the studies that have been released are factors of cost of the medicines, as well as challenges with being able to get sufficient access to the material necessary to build these medicines. And so that really then sets up the next set of hurdles, which build the walls that create equitable access to essential medicines for everyone on this planet. So the question then becomes, how do we address these challenges? And we posited that one of the ways to bring change to the system would be to recreate the supply chains. Essentially, rebuilding the supply chains that supply our medicines. And so, what if we could take this very familiar process of yeast fermentation, and instead of having the yeast make ethanol and carbon dioxide, the yeast could grow on sugar and very rapidly and very inexpensively make these complex molecules that you find from plants. Essentially, what we're asking is, can we engineer yeast to behave like plants while still maintaining the properties that we value in yeast as a manufacturing platform? Rapid doubling time, and also the ability to grow on inexpensive nutrients. We asked this question over 10 years ago, and the answer that we got back from the scientific community was, no, that's impossible. You can't do it. This was interesting to us because it then basically led us to think about what were the technological barriers that created that response, that this was impossible, and what did we have to do in terms of technology to development to allow for this type of future to be re realized. 
And so we essentially set out over the next 10 years to work through the technologies that needed to come together. And in fact, it was a set of different technologies that had to be brought together in order to create a pipeline to allow us to do this systematically. And I'm going to step you through the different pieces of this technology. The first thing that we're trying to do here is create a platform that allows us to unlock the full synthesis potential that's within nature. So the first thing we have to do is we have to go into the natural world and be able to uncover or recover the blueprint by which nature is performing these syntheses. And this, we utilize advances in sequencing and genomics. Now, with sequencing capacities, we can go into the natural world, pull very small sample sizes, and be able to recover back full genome sequences of a diversity of organisms. These genome sequences hold the key to how these molecules are being made. But then we need to take this data and be able to search through it and pull out the valuable set of information. And so that really requires an intersection of tools in biochemistry and informatics. Can we basically take these millions and billions of letters of sequences of DNA and basically pull out the genes or small segments of DNA that are responsible for making those medicines? And the answer is yes, we can with these two tools. Once we identify these genes, we then want to take them and put them into yeast. But we can't do that just by taking those sequences and moving them over because those sequences have evolved over thousands of years to be functional within plants, not yeast. So if we simply move that DNA into yeast, the yeast won't know what to do with it. We have to then use the tools of synthetic biology to allow us to recode those genes. And in some cases, we're making very large changes to the sequences of the gene so that the yeast can read out the directions for making the underlying activities. And in other cases, they're very small, but still very important changes that have to be made. So synthetic biology has now given us the tools and the framework to do this recoding systematically. And the final thing is that as we do this type of gene identification and recoding in many, many, many different types of medicinal plants, we can then use the tools of DNA synthesis to get those genes synthesized, simply type them into a computer, send it out to a company, and have it come back to us, and then the tools of synthetic biology to put that synthetic DNA into our yeast organism and combine genes in ways that we wouldn't find in nature. This allows us to create a more efficient synthesis platform, as well as one that will allow us to make molecules that go beyond what we find directly in nature. So we did this, and we started with what was viewed as sort of the most difficult challenge uh, in the field. And what we were able to demonstrate is that we could engineer yeast that could grow on sugar and make medicinal opioids that are not made directly by the poppy. This required a scale of engineering that was an order of magnitude greater than what was current state of the art at the time. These yeasts are engineered with over 30 different genes from over six different organisms. But we can grow them, and when they grow, they convert sugar into these higher value medicinal compounds. And now that we've done it, with this challenge, in going through that process, we have developed the technologies and the platforms that allow us to take those same strategies and systematize them and apply them to many, many other plant-derived molecules. So what we're essentially creating here is a new platform for manufacturing. You can think of a yeast cell now as a precision nanofactory, where that yeast cell is engineered to make many, many different synthetic proteins. Those proteins are pulled from nature but recoded so that we can direct at a subcellular level where they go within the yeast cell, and we're essentially creating these nano chemical assembly lines that will take in sugar and build it back up to these very complex, valuable molecules in a very precise way. The beauty of this technology is that it does it Without the use of toxic chemicals, it can do these syntheses. And it also does it with minimal use of arable land. And finally, we can leverage the ability of biology to replicate. So in contrast to other manufacturing platforms where you have to repeat 
the building of a manufacturing facility or the manufacturing process. This, in this example, we use the ability of biology to replicate. So once we have one yeast cell, we can create many, many, many copies of that yeast cells, millions and billions within a couple days. We can ultimately leverage that to create affordable and distributable manufacturing platforms. And as we systematize this with micro manufacturing uh, systems that are tailored to individual drug compounds. So I want to leave you with thinking about how the partnership between this advanced technology synthetic biology and age-old fermentation is essentially allowing us to unlock the synthesis capacities of nature. We can also partner this technology and Mother Nature to ensure a healthier and happier planet and people. And then finally, really in terms of realizing this future, we have to think about how we can break down the walls of medicine shortage, and that's going to require that we build new systems and structures to do so. And I'll thank you for your time. <laughs>